Today's lesson is on operant conditioning. So this is a development, a second lesson following conditioning. So if you haven't completed the work on classical conditioning, please can you make sure that you go back and complete that work before you move on to operant conditioning or a lot of the ideas and concepts today won't make uh, that much sense without having that foundation and understanding of classical conditioning. Um, it's going to be a relatively short video and a short lesson. The activities might take you um, a little bit of time, especially if you choose to be creative and, and build something. Uh, but here are our, uh, here's our lesson objective. We've got to be able to understand these three key terms, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. We're not going to apply them to the context of addiction today. We will start to do that um, next week once we've got these ideas fully understood and embedded before um, then we start to consider the research that looks at addiction. These three key terms, in particular negative reinforcement and punishment, are very easy to get confused. So we've got to make them clear uh, when we go through this PowerPoint, this video, um, make sure that you feel really confident being able to explain the difference between those two because A-level students, even university students, get those uh, concepts confused. And it's really important that you understand the difference between negative reinforcement and punishment. On class charts, I've included uh, a little bit of reading for you. This reading is completely optional. You don't have to do the reading. This reading isn't from a GCSE book. It is from another psychology book that I have. Um, there's about 10 pages all about Skinner, which is the psychologist that we're going to have a look at today. You can just see his name there. Um, the, the textbook goes into a little more detail than we require at GCSE. Uh, but that's not a bad thing at all. His ideas are really interesting. Uh, we will return to operant conditioning in the future when we get into looking at forensic psychology and other topics in year 11. So it's a good idea that you have a read through this before going through the PowerPoint. If not, you've always got this there as a, as a reference. So if there's anything that you're still struggling with at the end of this video or when you're doing your completing your activities, you can refer back to this. The GCSE textbook that we use doesn't go into a lot of detail about operant conditioning, which can make it a little bit difficult when you're trying to, to learn a new topic and there's not a lot of detail there. And I think it's a bit of a shame because it's a really interesting and brilliant theory. This theory has influenced so many different areas and approaches within psychology, um, even within our school setting, which we'll talk about every single day, we use this theory in school. So I said that operant conditioning is a development from classical conditioning. And we know that classical conditioning developed around 1902. That's when Ivan Pavlov first developed his theory and published his research using the dogs. So we know that Pavlov believed that we learn through association. If we start to associate um, a neutral stimulus with an unconditioned stimulus, which produces an unconditioned response, eventually the neutral stimulus will become a conditioned stimulus and therefore produce a conditioned response. So a lot of key terms there that we do need to know. If we just think about Pavlov's dogs, Pavlov's dogs, they would salivate on the production of food. So that is due to the smell, that is due to being able to see the food and that is a biological or physiological response. However, if every time we feed the dogs, we ring a bell, the bell, which is the neutral stimulus at the start of the conditioning process, eventually becomes associated with the food. So the bell therefore turns into a conditioned stimulus and will make the dog salivate on the sound of the bell without any food being present. And we used examples like your um, mobile phone alarm that might send horrible feelings to you when you hear that alarm, even if you're awake. And that's because we've associated um, that feeling of being awake with that noise, that noise at one point would have been a neutral stimulus and meant nothing to us. But through the process of conditioning and association, we have learned to dislike things like the mobile phone alarm. It's not always bad. It can be positive. We can associate positive experiences um, and positive feelings with neutral stimulus, um, which we um, we will well, which we applied sorry to uh, to addiction. Uh, and we started to explain why somebody might become addicted to alcohol because alcohol consumption releases dopamine. That makes us feel good. And therefore, we start to associate alcohol with that feeling, um, you know, the buzz of drinking out alcohol. And that can start to explain why some people develop an addiction to alcohol. 
However, there's a major issue with classical conditioning. I've put it there just underneath Pavlov's uh, picture. When we learn through associations, or if we accept the theory of learning through associations, the theory is quite basic. And associations struggle to explain how behaviours can be reinforced or used to stop behaviours. So we, we kind of referenced, uh, when we're talking about Pavlov, the mobile phones and how that is an we're learning through association something that's quite negative so therefore we're trying to avoid hearing that sound that sound that isn't nice to us when we hear a mobile phone alarm and Pavlov's theory struggles to explain why certain behaviors we actively seek out and certain behaviors we actively avoid through learning through association and this is where in the 1930s a man called B.F. Skinner then went back to Pavlov's original theory and started to address some of these concerns. And Skinner believed that the outcome of behavior could be determined through the type of response elicited from the stimulus. So if we associate a positive with a neutral stimulus, we are actively going to start to seek out and try and engage that behavior again. If we associate something negative with the neutral stimulus, then we're going to try and avoid that situation. Now, he referred to that as punishment, and that's not to get it confused with negative reinforcement. Now, Skinner based his ideas on another psychologist's work called Thorndike. We don't need to know the name or the research of Thorndike. We just need to know the law of effect. And the law of effect is very simple. When our behavior is rewarded, we are more likely to repeat the behavior again. And that's what Skinner called positive reinforcement. And it makes a lot of sense. If you are rewarded for doing something, you are actively going to try and receive that same reward again. However, oops, sorry. if our behavior is punished, we are less likely to repeat the behavior again because we then start to associate the neutral stimulus, the behavior, with something extremely negative. So we will try and avoid that situation at all costs. Now, if we just think about positive reinforcement and punishment, I mentioned earlier that this theory is used in school on a daily basis. If we just think about our reward system, whenever you complete behavior or display behavior, you carry out actions that the school rules want you to carry out, such as handing your homework in on time, making sure that you're punctual to lessons, making sure that your uniform's looking nice, neat and tidy, I as a teacher will reward that behavior with achievement points. And we know that eventually, if you receive so many achievement points, you then are rewarded with maybe a trip to the cinema or uh, it might be a raffle prize, etc. I think each individual year group is slightly different. And that's because we want to encourage that behavior. So we want you to always hand your homework in on time. We want you to always ensure that your uniform is correct and you're looking smart. And we always want to make sure that you are punctual to lessons. If you struggle to fail, to meet the school rules, then you are punished. And that punishment could be a behavior comment. So it might be writing in your planner. It might be giving you a behavior point on class charts. And it could be more severe, such as a detention. So if you miss your homework entirely, you might receive a detention. And that is because we are trying to discourage that behavior from happening again in the future. However, then we've got the third key term, which is negative reinforcement. And Skinner also explained that if we start to associate a neutral stimulus with the removal of an unpleasant or negative feeling or state, then again, we're likely to repeat those actions. Now, it's very simplistic if I refer to food, but we'll use that just to explain. If you are feeling hungry, hungry puts you in an unpleasant state. So your stomach might start to rumble, you start to feel weak and out of energy. Therefore, in theory, if you eat food, it removes that negative state. So therefore, your stomach is no longer rumbling. You've got enough energy to complete actions. And therefore, it negatively reinforces that that is good behavior. Now, it's still strengthening the behavior. It's still strengthening learning. However, you're not directly being rewarded for it. It's just now removing an unpleasant state. Now, I've used the example of food there in eating, but that is far too simplistic. It's probably not the best example for me to use because the process of eating and cetacean when you feel full or when you feel hungry is extremely complicated. Uh, and if it were as, as simple as negative reinforcement, then things like dieting would be extremely easy 
um, and we'd all be nice, healthy individuals. So we'll use the example that Skinner used. Now Skinner used something called a Skinner box and the Skinner box was just a cage that he used as the purpose of his experiments. So here we have a rat inside a Skinner box. You can see that there are three key elements to this Skinner box to make it a Skinner box and not just a normal cage. The first is a lever or a button. You can see there literally the rat is pressing the button and it turns the light on at the top. When the rat presses the button, you will see then it moves straight to the food dispenser because pressing the button releases a pellet of food. There is also a wired metal floor. So it's not like a normal cage where you might have a plastic base. The wired metal floor is extremely important. Now we'll start off by talking about positive reinforcement. When a rat is first placed inside this cage, a rat does not understand and has not learnt that pressing a lever or button will have any effect whatsoever. However, as the rat naturally starts to explore the cage, it will accidentally push the lever and this will result in a food pellet being released. Now, the first time the rat does this, it will start to learn through association that pressing the lever will release food. And it might not learn straight away, but if it does this a number of times, it will then start to associate the food with the lever. So therefore, the rat is being positively reinforced that pressing the lever is a good thing. It's being rewarded for that behavior. So the rat will actively seek out to continuously press the lever to receive the reward, which is food. Now, this is where the wired metal floor um, becomes really important. Because if we change the lever so that the lever when pressed does not release a food pellet, but electrocutes the rat through the wired metal floor, then we will see that the rat will soon stop the behavior of pressing the lever. So we could put a rat in there, allow it to explore the cage, allow it to associate the lever with the food pellet, it's being positively reinforced, so the rat will continuously press the lever to receive the food. However, we could then be quite devious, as Skinner was, change the outcome of pressing the lever to an electric shock to see what the rat would do. How many times would it take the rat to be electrocuted before it realized that pressing the lever was no longer positive and no longer releasing food? Well, it would only take the rat maybe one or two presses of the lever before it realized, don't press the lever. The rat is being punished now for pressing the lever, so the rat would soon learn to now associate the lever not with the reward, but now with punishment, and avoid pressing the lever altogether. So that's the positive reinforcement and the punishment. However, now we have to consider the negative reinforcement. And again, the wired metal floor becomes really important. Now, this isn't being displayed in this video. That's why I've had to add the clip art of the electric, uh, the electric shock. The wired metal floor is now continuously electrocuting the rat. So not just when the rat presses the lever. As soon as the rat is placed in the cave, it is being placed under a constant state of electric shock. So this is quite painful and distressing for the rat. Naturally, the rat will explore the cage again, looking for a means of escape. And eventually, it will accidentally press the lever. Now, the lever this time stops the electric shocks. So now the wire floor is no longer electrocuting the rat. So this removes the pain and the discomfort that the rat had experienced. And we know that the rat then soon learns to associate pressing the lever with stopping the pain because if we then electrify the floor again, the rat will most, almost instantaneously run towards the lever to stop the electric shocks. Now with Skinner's box, he demonstrates that the rat will learn behaviors very quickly if you reward their actions. He also said that a rat will learn to stop behaviors if you punish their actions. So by pressing the lever, if it produces a, an immediate electric shock, the rat will soon learn that the lever is something to be avoided. But Skinner also demonstrated that we learn through negative reinforcement. If we're in a constant state of discomfort and we carry out behaviors that remove the discomfort, we soon learn to associate that that behavior is also good and therefore we will actively seek out that behavior also.
So I'm going to give you a choice of activities now just to consolidate and develop your understanding of operant conditioning. We don't want to race through operant conditioning because there's a, um, it, like I mentioned earlier, it's really easy to get those three key terms, especially punishment and negative reinforcement confused. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to choose one of these two. Now, normally we would do this in class. This is something that I enjoy doing every year with students, even in year, um, year 12. I want you to build your own Skinner box. So use resources that you might have around the house um, to build a Skinner box. In your Skinner box, you must demonstrate positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and punishment. So your Skinner box has to demonstrate that there is an electric flow because that's extremely important. It needs a lever or a button for a rat to press and it needs an area for the rat to receive reward of the food. So in the past, many students have brought in shoe boxes. So if you've got an empty shoe box uh, lying around your house or an empty cereal box that you could potentially use, uh, you might even have uh, an old hamster cage or something like that that you could use, that'd be absolutely fine. Obviously, do not use a real hamster or a gerbil for this activity. We don't want to uh, to break any ethical guidelines with hurting animals needlessly. You could use a, a, a aluminium foil for the electric floor. Um, students in the past have used old socks and turned them into rats, or they've used um, toys that their cats might have had um, to demonstrate the rat. But once you've created your model, and that might take you a little bit of time, make sure that you label it all, and then you can create a short revision video for yourself. So normally I'd ask students to use their mobile phones to explain what is actually happening with the process of positive, negative, and punishment. If you don't want to create a video, you can take photographs and create a storyboard step by step. You'd need a minimum of three photographs. Any videos or photographs that you take is just for your own personal revision tools. I'm not going to ask you to submit them. I'm not going to show them in class. So don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel a bit concerned about um, talking on camera. It's only for your own benefit. And by completing this activity, you really do push this information into your long-term memory because it then becomes an episodic memory, which means it's really personal to you. So you can make it as fun as you want to make it. You can make it as serious as you want to make it. Um, but it, you know, the more effort and the more personalization you put into this task, the more likely it is to be stored in your long-term memory without the need to continuously rehearse and rehearse and rehearse. If you don't want to do that, you can carry out the second activity. And this is just writing standardized procedures. So what I'd like you to do is write standardized procedures for Skinner's research. Now, we don't have um, all the detail of Skinner's uh, research, so you can just add detail as long as we've been really clear how to use the Skinner box, we're going to imagine that somebody else has asked you as an expert, how do I replicate Skinner's research? So you're going to give them the standardized procedures, the set detailed instructions so that they can replicate the study to assess the reliability. Always remember with standardized procedures, it needs to be written in a clear and unambiguous manner. So that just basically means that if somebody's reading your standardized procedures, they shouldn't have any questions about the details and the specifics of the experiment. The more detail, the less ambiguous, um, the, the better the standardized procedures. By completing this activity, it might not be as fun and creative as the previous activity, but this one will develop your understanding of research methods because we know that we need to know standardized procedures as part of research methods. I've included um, the diagram there just to help you. It's um, another variation of Skinner's uh, box. I'm also going to upload a short video that explains Pavlov and Skinner's research. I'm gonna try and put that on YouTube in the next couple of days. It doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it de demonstrates some of the variations of Pavlov and Skinner. And hopefully that will also help you understand the theory of classical conditioning and operant conditioning. Then next week, we'll start to apply it specifically to addiction, and then we'll look at the third theory of behaviorism, which is social learning theory.